In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the option of rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things which we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Last night we went over a lot of promises dealing with the faith rest drill because our Lord was actually talking about the faith rest drill and how we must rest in faith and not be worried and not have anxiety in life. He continues in 1030 with this principle where he says, Even all the hair of your head are numbered. Now this is a, there's no better way to explain that God is in control by the fact that he knows that every one of your hairs are numbered, each of us individually. And some of us have fewer hairs, and some of us have a lot of hairs. And God has each one of them numbered, and he knows when one hair falls from your head. So how much more then should you not worry? If God keeps a, a tab on the hairs in your head, He's definitely going to keep a tabs on your money supply. He's going to keep a tab on every problem you've ever had in life. And the only thing you have to do is use the faith rest drill and believe it. And when a problem comes along, all you have to do is believe that the Lord knew about it and it's going to be taken care of. That is, if you use the faith rest drill, if you use some of the promises that we studied last night, such as, now we know that to those who love God, He causes all things to work together for good for those who are called or elected to privilege and called on the basis of a predetermined plan. Or Psalm 16:8, I have set the Lord continually before me because He is at my right hand, therefore I will not be shaken. That's a promise. And we also studied a promise that was given in the midst of the fifth cycle of discipline, for Israel, and that's Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindness never cease. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So the fact that every hair on our head is numbered should be one reason for us to relax in life. It doesn't mean we can be lazy, and it should never be an excuse to be lazy, but it means we can relax. And do you know you can be working up a storm and you can have sweat running off your brow and be completely relaxed? And you might see someone working real hard and you say, that person's not relaxed. Well, you can't look into their souls and really know that. Relax doesn't mean that you have to uh, lay down on a couch. You could go out here and mow the lawn and be completely relaxed and enjoy what you're doing. You could go down to the place where we're going to have church eventually and work on that and be completely relaxed. It's a mental attitude, and it doesn't mean because you work and because you need to work, because all of us do, especially us who are men, we must work by the sweat of our brow. That is, if we have that type of occupation. And that doesn't mean you're not relaxed necessarily. It just means you're doing your duty as unto the Lord. And when you do it as unto the Lord, well, you do it with a relaxed mental attitude. And you might not get frustrated doing it, but you enjoy doing it. And, and some people really enjoy work, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And then in 1031, so do not be afraid. You are worth more than all the sparrows. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than all the sparrows. And we had a comparison last night uh, concerning the sparrow. A sparrow was worth about a half hour's wages during the time of Israel. Now, the Israelites were poor during this time because they were under the fourth cycle of discipline and they were being punished. So a half hour's wage for an Israelite would be very, very slim 
what they made was hardly nothing. It would be like us probably making a buck an hour, so it would be a, a comparable to about 30 cents. Don't hold me to that exactly, but it's a really a low price. And the sparrow was the cheapest thing they could buy at the market. And so do not be afraid. You're worth more than sparrows. And the Lord knows when a sparrow falls, how much more is he going to know when you are going through problems? He does know. He'll take care of you. And the testing might last for one, two, three years. And you might go through some horrible events that you think are horrible. But we have problem-solving devices, remember. We can rebound when we get a little too frustrated and get out of fellowship. And that's grace. And then we can name our sins and we can be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then we can relax. We can rest in Him as it says in Hebrews chapter 14 verse 1 or Hebrews 4 1. And that's where it gives us the idea of the faith rest drill and the fact that we must rest in Him. And so do not be afraid you are worth more than all the sparrows. And you can extrapolate from this the fact of 1 Timothy 1 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. That's the integrity envelope. Number seven and number eight, personal love for God and impersonal love for mankind. And when these two function, you can actually have true love and of a sound mind. And you see, all of us have a tendency to uh, break from reality now and then, me included in which uh, we just, uh, the, the, all the problems of life uh, squash us into a state where we just escape into fantasy land or we just, uh, well, we start to act a bit nuts. And then later we have to apologize to everybody and say, sorry I got out of line, I was a bit nuts. Well, it, all, it happens to all of us and it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. But what we must learn to do is apply this. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Don't be scared. God's going to take care of you. But of power and of love. And this love, as we've noted, number seven and number eight, the integrity envelope on the plot line. And if you don't have that, your marriage is going to suffer until you get it. That is for all of us, me included. Until we can be able to use impersonal love and switch you see, the uh, husband might be being overbearing. So you just switch to impersonal love. And you still must respect your husband, ladies. That's what's commanded. And you husbands might have a hard time loving your wives when they get a little bit cantankerous and they get a little bit out of line. Well, switch to impersonal love. You can't change them. They have volition. The only thing you can do is make sure you're in fellowship. And when they see how long you stay in fellowship and how happy you are no matter what they do, marriage becomes a success because it's part of staying power. The same staying power that was given to Christ on the cross has been given to us. And we can withstand any pressures from mankind. That is if we have the spiritual strength. And it takes time and you sit and say, I don't have that yet. Well, plug along at it. Keep going. Keep pushing. Keep going forward. It's like a boxer that gets knocked down. What do they do? They get back up and they keep on boxing. And sometimes they end up winning even though they were about knocked silly the first round. I've seen that happen. And one time I saw Mike Tyson fighting a huge man from Denmark. I mean, this man was huge. And most of it was fat and he had a lot of muscle too. And Mike Tyson would go up and Mike Tyson's powerful, especially back then. He's gotten a little weak now because of lack of self-discipline. But back then, I mean, he just went up and he, bow, right hooked him. And the man didn't even look phased. And he, he just stood there and took it. And he wasn't getting very many punches in, but Mike Tyson just kept pounding him and pounding him until the point Mike Tyson got very tired. Now Mike Tyson eventually did win the fight with points. He couldn't knock the man out. The man had an attitude of, I'm going to keep going. Plus, he was tough. I mean, if he were to hit me, I'd fall out right here. But the point is, for us spiritually, is to be tough. Take the hard knocks of life and keep going. Keep pushing. Keep going with the Word of God. It's our only hope. Then in 1032, it says this, Whoever then identifies me before people, I will identify before my Father in heaven. Now, this doesn't have to do with uh, salvation, this has to do with after salvation. You see, some of you might be saved. Some of you may have believed in Christ. 
but some of you might be ashamed of the gospel. And you might say, I'm not going to give the gospel to my friends because, well, it won't be cool. And they won't think of me as cool if I go up to my friends and say, believe in Christ. And they'll think I'm a little weird in the head. Well, that means you're ashamed of the gospel. And what our Lord is saying, look, for those of you who love me, you will proclaim it. You will give the gospel once you know enough about it to give it. I'm not telling you that if you don't know enough about the Bible uh, to give it, you have to know enough to give it. And so when you give the gospel, well, don't be ashamed of it and don't think, I won't be looked at as cool. Don't be ashamed to tell your friends about Christ because what he says here, but whoever denies me before people, that means they're more concerned about what people think than what God thinks. And if you were really concerned about your friends, you would make sure that they had the gospel. And some of you have friends that were uh, that who are unbelievers. I did, and I, I don't today. Not because I choose to. It's just because I'm I, I live kind of a hermit life now. But uh, and in, in my high school years, I would be around unbelievers, and I would witness to them. I wasn't ashamed of the gospel. Neither should you be. And if you are, well, guess what? If you don't identify Christ before your Father in heaven. Well, you lose some eternal reward. Now, it doesn't mean that witnessing equals eternal reward. And don't get me confused with that. That would be a type of legalism. It's a mental attitude. It means you love the Lord so much you don't care what people think. It's a mental attitude. And you may never have a chance to witness except every now and then an unbeliever will cross your path. And for the most part, you might hang around with all believers, which is to totally normal and fine. So I'm not saying you must go out and witness to be blessed or to receive reward in heaven. It's a mental attitude saying, I'm not ashamed of it. And when the opportunity arises, I'll take it. But that's all derived. You see, witnessing is not the means of the spiritual life. It's a result of it. You live your spiritual life as a result. Eventually, you'll witness. Eventually, once you grow up enough, to love the Lord enough to know that it's important and you come to a point where you love God the Father enough to know that it's important that other people hear these things, then you'll do it. It's a result of it, not a means. And today, the churches get means and results mixed up. And they say, you must witness and if you don't, you're not going to be rewarded. But then they're going out not filled with the God, the Holy Spirit, and they're, go they're all getting charged up saying, rah, 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 I'm going to go out and witness to the world. Well, if they're not filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and if they don't know enough to witness, their works are wood, hay, and stubble, and they will be burned. So the spiritual life comes first. Production comes second. Now, I've never told you not to, pro to, pro to produce divine good. Of course, you should. We're all commanded to. But we must know something before we can produce something. We must know divine good before we can produce divine good. If we start out with just producing good, it'll be human good. Because we won't even know that we need to name our sins before we go out and witness. See, every night before I get up and teach, I have to do the same thing you do. Rebound. That is, if it's necessary. And so I rebound and then ask it. And then while you're silently praying, I say a little prayer for myself that I'll communicate it effectively. And usually I have to name sins just like you do and get with it and start teaching. And you receive having being filled, having the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Without that, you're, you're, you've lost. You're, you're using human power. You're not moving forward. You're spinning your wheels down a hill. It's like if it was an icy day and you're trying to go up a hill and you got your uh, gas pedal to the floor and the, the back tires, if you have a real, 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 whatever, if you have one of them uh, rear wheel drives and they start spinning real fast and it tries to push you up the hill, but if it's icy, you'll go right backwards. That's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the feeling of God, the Holy Spirit, no matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, it's not going to work. God, the Holy Spirit, is the fuel, the power for this spiritual life. So the fact is, whoever then identifies me before people, I will identify before my Father in heaven. And this is for the means of reward. 
It doesn't mean he's going to identify them as per salvation. And he's not going to say, this person witnessed to a thousand people, therefore he's great and gets into heaven. That's not what it means. It might be misconstrued that way, but that's not what it means. What it's saying is this. It's saying, uh, look, you identify me in terms of witnessing, in terms of using your spiritual gift, whatever it is. I'll identify you before God and you'll receive eternal reward. You're already there. You're just going to get a little extra. 1033, but whoever denies me before people, I will deny him. And this doesn't mean he'll deny him of eternal life. It means he'll deny him of reward. There's nothing here about eternal life. And people who preach against eternal security will say, look, you've denied Christ before people, or you haven't mentioned him, therefore Christ is going to deny you, and therefore you won't go to heaven. But that's not what it means. It's a, a denying of eternal rewards. I will deny him also before my Father in heaven. In other words, no eternal rewards for you, you didn't have enough spiritual self-esteem to not worry about people. You were too worried about what people would think. You were too worried that you wouldn't look cool if you went and uh, witnessed. Well, you get beyond all that when you grow in grace, and it takes a while. There was a time when I was timid and very shy, and I didn't like to give the gospel, but I would occasionally. But it took spiritual growth. Starting out, it, was, it, it took a lot to even open my mouth as a teenager. I, just, I was a shy person. I grew out of it, and mostly because I grew in grace and received some spiritual self-esteem. If it weren't for doctrine, I'd be some weird hermit. But instead, a doctrine got a hold of me, and I got some spiritual self-esteem, and now if uh, someone needs the gospel and I see that, I'm going to give it to them. And that's the way you should be, but it takes spiritual growth, and don't hang your head if you say, I'm not there yet and I still feel a little shaky about giving the gospel. That's a normal reaction in spiritual childhood, but you've got to grow up, and it takes time. And, and finally, uh, once you get to that place where you can just uh, go up to anybody and, and they uh, act as if, you see, you don't force it on them. Usually, they act as if they have some interest, and they say uh, they might say something about God, and then you'll say, well, do you know God is perfect, and we're imperfect, and Jesus Christ came down to the earth and died as a substitute for us? And you tell them that, it might be the first time they ever heard it, and they believe. But when you love somebody, think about it. If you like some girl in high school, what are you going to do? Talk about her. And you're going to go to your mom or your dad or your friends and say, so-and-so is a real sweet, pretty girl, and I like her, and I'm going out with her. Why? Well, you like her. You're going to talk about her. And if you have a love relationship with the Lord, you talk about who you love. And if you love the Lord, you're going to talk about him. It's a, it's a result of your spiritual life, though, and not a means. And don't get those confused. Then in uh, 1034, Jesus Christ really brings it home. And he does it in a tough way uh, because all of us have families. We all love our families. But he's about to say something that is actually, it's very true. It's something that uh, a lot of people have problems with when they grow up spiritually because they get to a point where they're even hated by their families. And there's a reason for it. And it has to do with what I'm about to put on the board. I won't light it up just yet. I need to plug it in anyway. But we'll start out here in uh, 1034. Do not presume that I have come to bring peace on to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. You see, the cross, that is where our Lord is going. The cross is the basis for spiritual warfare. It's spiritual. And even though it's invisible, it has some visible repercussions. And it divides the human race. The cross has always divided the human race. And even in China today, it's not so pronounced here, although it can be among families. But even in China today, if one family member believes in Christ and the other family member is a member of the Communist Party, one family member will rat out the other. 
and they will run to the authorities and they will say, my brother so-and-so has been uh, congregating with some Christians. You need to arrest them. And the authorities will go arrest them, brother against brother. Even mother against daughter, even father against son, and it's happened. And it it's happens here. Now, we're more, more civilized as a client nation, but it still happens. There's still friction. There's always friction between the cosmic system and God's system. So do not presume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. So Christ is a divider, really, and not a uniter. Our president got up uh, in the beginning of his campaign in the year 2000 and said, I'm a uniter and not a divider. Well, look what's happened today. Now, that was his intention. He was sincere about it. He wanted to unite America. And he got up in the 2000 campaign when he was running against Al Gore and he said, I'm a uniter, not a divider, because the other people were dividers. And they would divide on the basis of vitriol. But he got up and said, no, I want to unite everybody. We're Americans. We need to be united. And he was right. But what happened was he got involved in something that uh, he wasn't too aware of. It, the cosmic system versus the unique spiritual life. The cosmic system, Satan system versus believers. And he was a believer. And he didn't think anything about getting up in front of the camera and saying, Jesus Christ is my role model. And then that would go out all across America. And some people didn't like it. They were shocked by it. And they said, oh, he shouldn't be talking about religion as a president. And they would say stupid stuff like that. Every president has his own beliefs concerning religion. By, by the way, we were founded with a freedom of religion. And it wouldn't matter if he were a Jew, a Muslim, or a Christian. They have a right as president to get up and say whatever they want concerning their beliefs. They're still a person. And, but uh, they attacked him. And even though he tried to unite the country, it's today just as divided as it ever has been before. Even though we're at war, it's divided. And this is because of Christ. He's a believer and unbelievers hate that. Now, I don't know where he is spiritually. None of my business where he is spiritually. But I know he's a believer from his own testimony, from his own mouth. And he's uh, doing a pretty good job. I would do some things differently, but maybe I would screw things up too. So I don't know everything. But he's the president, and we must stick behind him. But he has seen the fact that there's a sword. There's a sword that divides unbelievers from believers. And there's a sword that divides, uh, divides people who are positive toward doctrine from people who are negative. The same sword. And then he goes on in 1035 to say this, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother. And that's almost unnatural, you would think. But it happens when one gets with the spiritual life and the other doesn't care for it. I talk to people all the time, some people who have uh, converted from Catholicism to Baptist, and they may have become a Baptist. And well, their, their uh, Catholic family will about disown them, disown them. They say, you're not a Catholic anymore. That's wretched. Well, there's a sword there. And there's always a sword developed when there's uh, even just a little bit of doctrine being taught as a little bit is taught in Baptist churches. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he goes on. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So what occurs here, and this is straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ, and what occurs is that the cosmic system. Now I can put this on the board, and I'll go ahead and plug it in. And we've studied this before, but uh, we finally got to this verse, so we'll go over it again. There's a great divide. There's a great divide between mankind. Now on the one side, we have what is called the cosmic system. And you say, what is cosmic? Well, if you look in uh, 1 John, you will uh, read passages such as, Do not be of the world. Uh, do not follow the world. Well, the world in the Greek is cosmos. 
and that is Satan's system. Who is the ruler of the world? Satan. So when it says don't be of the world, it, what it means, it doesn't mean you can't wear makeup and go to dances. That's legalism. This means don't be of the cosmic system. Don't be of the world. Don't be in Satan's system. And Satan has, Satan's a genius and he has a tremendous system, a political system, all types of systems that could suck us into it, even as believers. Now, the unbeliever can function outside of the cosmic system by doing those things that are listed in Ecclesiastes, such as loving his wife, not cheating on her, uh, loving his job, loving his country. Well, he's outside of the cosmic system. But when this unbeliever who loves his wife, loves his job, loves his country, comes into contact with the gospel, and then says, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, when he says that, that unbeliever immediately goes into the cosmic system and he changes as a person. And it's an unbeliever who has rejected Christ lives in the cosmic system. And they go from being very conservative, from being very establishment oriented, to all of a sudden becoming very liberal and in the cosmic system. It's happened to many unbelievers before. Barry Goldwater was a great conservative. He was a Jew and an unbeliever and he was in the 1960s, way before any of you could even remember his name. Uh, but Barry Goldwater uh, was an unbeliever, and uh, my pastor knew him personally, and he became a senator as well. And they fought in the war together, and he loved his country very much, and he knew that uh, we needed a strong military. He even ran for president, by the way. And he knew that we needed a strong military. He loved his country. He loved his family. He loved his job. But then somewhere along the line, he received the gospel, probably from my pastor, if not from someone else. And then he rejected it. He, didn't, he never did come to believe in Christ. And so toward the end of his life, he, you know what he started saying? If you watched the news then or took any interest, you would know. But if you don't know, don't worry about it. It's, it's just a detail of history. But he said... Uh, you know what? Uh, homosexuality is all right. It should be sanctioned by the state. I mean, he went from a conservative to an almost a flaming liberal, then he died. But he went into the cosmic system because he rejected Christ. Now, for us as believers, we have two choices. We can either be in the spiritual life, and when we're under the spiritual life, we're in the we're under what's called the divine dinosphere, or you're living your unique spiritual life. It's a separate, this is God's system, God's divine system. And when you learn and grow in grace and in knowledge, when you use the uh, ten problem-solving devices, when you do these things, you're under the divine system. But if you reject it and say, I don't like that, I don't like the word as it's being taught or however. I want to go the way I've always been going in the energy of the flesh. You do that, then you're a believer. Well, you see, it can go two ways. You can be a believer who neglects the word of God. And that means you're too busy for it. And you don't necessarily hate it. And you're not going to necessarily uh, be angry at someone who teaches the word of God correctly. You just neglect it. You've got better things to do. But then we have, that's cosmic one. You're still in the cosmic system. And if you stay there long enough, you will convert to cosmic two. Cosmic two is the believer who rejects the word of God. And there is, a, it becomes a polarization. So we have a lot of people in the United States who have rejected the word of God. And we have a few people who want to live in the power sphere. That's what divine dynasphere means. It's the power sphere. What's the power? The filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z, learning the Word of God. These two come into a natural conflict, and many of you have probably noticed that in your own lives. I've noticed it in mine most definitely. And uh, people want to, I've seen people not even knowing what I believe, not even having a clue what I've been studying my whole life, and attack me and tell me what I should be doing. Yet I would never get up in their face and tell them what they should be doing, but they've done it before. Well, that's the cosmic system reacting to the divine system. And even the, you see, the cosmic system loves its own. That's found in 1 John, and I can't wait to get to 1 John. But we'll have to wait because we're going to go book by book. 
But we have to understand there is a split. There's a sword. It's a spiritual sword. And there is no personality that can change that. And you might have people in your family whom you love very much. And if they suddenly realize you're living under your unique spiritual life, they'll come attack you. They will attack you personally. They will talk about you behind your back. They will try to destroy your reputation. They tried to destroy our Lord's. And then, uh, well, since we're his servants, how much more are they going to de try to destroy us? And they will. And they will attack you. But it's not a, a point where we can say, well, they're attacking me. I can have a personality change and, and get them to like me. It's not true. It won't work that way. Because you see, we will study shortly that John the Baptist was a very moral man. He would even look moral in the eyes of the legalist. He never touched wine. He never overate. He ate honey and locust. Never even touched wine. Never even uh, did anything that would be considered wrong by society. And you know what they said about John the Baptist? They said, he has a demon! And then our Lord, who is perfect, came to the earth and he came eating and drinking, meaning he ate and he drank wine. And they called him a glutton and a wine bibber. Wine bibber is equivalent to an alcoholic. They called him a glutton and an alcoholic and also someone who associated with prostitutes, which, which means they accused him of fornicating with prostitutes. He never did that. But you see, it didn't matter about the different personalities. John the Baptist, a, a stoic type personality, he would never do anything that society would consider wrong. Anyway, if we put it in today's terms, uh, John the Baptist would never be seen with a cigarette. John the Baptist would never be seen holding a can of beer or a bottle of beer. John the Baptist wouldn't be seen doing that. It, he didn't like those things. It wasn't his purpose on earth. He didn't really care about them. It was his own personality and his own liking. And they still said, you have a demon. And then we have Jesus Christ who did uh, partake of a little wine and who did eat with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners. And they said, he has a demon. Well, you can't satisfy legalism. And you can't change your personality and change your way of life thinking that they will be assuaged. Now, you might do that and end up compromising and becoming just like them. And if you become just like them, they will be assuaged. Because you've just, guess what you've just done? You've did as what First John told you not to do. You have went and decided to live as if you were in the world or of the world. You were all in the world, but you decided to live as if you were of the world, of the cosmic system. That's why the attack goes away when you start to follow them. But all of us will be attacked, and you've probably seen it in your own life. Vitriolic attack, lies. People will lie about you. They see you in the, in the the living the spiritual life, and you're telling them like it is. They'll make up lies about you. They will destroy your character, and it's going to hurt. But Jesus said it's not going to be easy. He said, look, I come to bring a sword. 1041. Well, 1040, let's... Con well, I, I jumped way ahead. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household, 1036. And then 1037. It says, whoever loves father or mother more than me. This deals with phileo. Phileo is a Greek word of personal love. It means you have a personal love for your father and your mother, which is normal, it's natural, it's part of the human condition. But our Lord said, whoever loves father or mother more than me. He doesn't say don't love father and mother, of course not. What he says is if you love them more than me. You see, uh, you might have a father or a mother or both who do not like you listening to the word of God. And what you do is use impersonal love toward them. Don't confront them. Don't go up to them and say, I'm going to do what I want. You're wrong. I'm right. You just uh, go whatever. You're under their authority, especially father and mother, under their authority. And what you might do if they say, uh, never go back to that church again, well, just uh, order the tapes. Or order a tape or something else. Listen to it on your own when they're not around and or when uh, they don't really care what you're doing. And then uh, they won't bother you about it. 
So it, it, it's hard when you're under authority. It's been hard for a lot of women I've known in the past who had husbands who said, I don't want you listening to that man anymore. And their husbands would say that. Well, they're under their authority. So they would have to stop going to church. But guess what? Late at night while their husband was sleeping, they had enough love for God to get up, put in a tape and lay down beside their husband, listen to it, wouldn't even wake him up, wouldn't even bother him. And they would grow in grace and in knowledge that way. And sometimes we have to go it alone in that manner, especially if we're under authority. And it's much harder for women who are under authority uh, to deal with these things than it is for a man because a man who has any uh, gumption about him will say, I'll do what I want, you do what you want, I know what's right. But a woman... Uh, she can't look at him, I'm going to do what I want to do. Because I mean, he's the authority. And he might be a jerk about it and say, you're going to do what I want to do. Well, what you do is just do what you need to do quietly. And without a word, remember, from First Peter. So whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy. Now, this is, doesn't mean you're not worthy of eternal salvation. When you believe in Christ, you have eternal salvation. But you, you, none of us are really worthy of it. But what he's saying is this is an indication you're not living your protocol spiritual life. Our Lord lived the prototype, remember. Our Lord lived the perfect prototype spiritual life, passed it on to us in the form of a protocol, and gave us a few extra things because of our old sin nature. So whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So it can go both ways. Either the uh, son and daughter or whoever, your children could reject it. And then uh, if your children re reject it, you uh, well, you have to let them do what they're going to do. But uh, if you see, uh, you love your, well, actually, let's put it this way. Whoever loves father and mother more than me. You're, uh, you are teenagers under the authority of your parents. And you say to yourself, I love the Word of God. I love listening to the Word of God. That's what I want to do. But then your mother and father come along and say, No, nah, don't do that. This isn't right for you. It's going to corrupt your mind. And that's what it happens because it's a sword. So what it's telling you is, Look, you love your father or mother more than me, more than Christ. Now, Christ isn't trying to take you out from under their authority, and he's not giving you reason to say, forget you, I'll do what I want. He's giving reason for you to obey them even more and to on your own free time, if they pr don't permit you. You see, there have been some cases where there is a, a, Jehovah, a Jehovah Witness, a person, a young person, maybe 14, 15 years old, who was under the Jehovah Witness religion and they've come under correct doctrinal teaching. And then they said, you know what, to themselves, I like this stuff, but there's no way my Jehovah Witness mother and father is going to put up with me listening to this. So they would do it in privacy and in secrecy. And that's how they grew up spiritually. But they never challenged their parents' authority. That's not going to work. And you don't do that. Never, ever, for anything, not even something this important. You just say, all right, I won't do it. And they'll leave you alone. Because when they see that you're not going there, well, they'll think that uh, everything's fine. And then when you're laying in bed at night when, and you're listening to a tape, even if they caught you listening to a tape, they're not going to be that concerned about it because you're not physically there. And that is the way you would do it. And if you did it that way, it would indicate on your part positive volition. It would indicate something that you are doing something phenomenal. You love God more than your father and mother. That's what it's saying. And you're not worthy if you don't. What it's saying, it's not telling you not to love your parents. What it's saying, and you can get a little goofy with this, what it's saying is the word of God's number one. Nothing else is more important. And if you have Bible doctrine number one, you'll make a way to do it in a way in which it won't offend others and you can do it on your own. And that's what it's saying. Live it alone. Go it on your own. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And that means sometimes even sons and daughters have had influence over their parents. And they've said, I don't like that man. He's a little too tough with me. I don't like this. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to do that. And instead of saying, look, we're going. You're under the authority of me. We're all going. 
They cave into it and say, all right, we don't have to. Well, that means you've loved your son or daughter more than Christ. And, and following Christ, is, it is, it's really an easy thing, but the, what you need to do is get your eyes off people and your eyes on the Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And our Lord never said that he was going to come and bring peace among families. And I see on the back of cars all the time, the family that prays together stays together. That's not necessarily true whatsoever. They might both be praying out of fellowship and it has no meaning. Now the family that lives the spiritual life together definitely stays together. Definitely. There's no way around it. When both parents are growing in grace and in knowledge, it's going to work. There's no way it can't work. Oh, there'll be fights. There always is. They're sin natures. But if they have a grace enough attitude, they'll get back with it and say, we're both going the full route. And they'll have their disagreements. There's no way around that. But uh, there's no way a family where they're both growing spiritually can fail. No way. Now, if one decides, no, I don't like it, and the other says, yes, I do, there's a possibility of failure, but one might carry the marriage. But if both say, I don't care about it, well, that's why we have so much divorce today. Because they can't handle each other's sin natures because they're not grace-oriented. Then he goes on to say this, and whoever does not take up his cross... Now, this does not refer to the uh, cross of Christ specifically. Of course not. None of us can take up the cross of Christ. He did something special, something far and above and beyond what we could ever do. But this is a reference to the Roman style of crucifixion where the condemned person carried their own cross to the place of execution. This means that you uh, do what it takes to make Bible doctrine number one. That's what it means. When you take up your cross, you're living your spiritual life. You're following in the footsteps of Christ. You see, our Lord used the prototype spiritual life to do what? To take up the cross. And he hung on the cross under the concept of the prototype spiritual life. It was a prototype. He was testing it and proving it. And then when all of our sins were imputed to him and judged on the cross, he handled it. And not only did he handle it, he handled it, as it says in Hebrews, with exhibited happiness. He handled it. And even though it was excruciatingly painful, he was hanging up there on the cross and was happy and handled it and dealt with it. So we live the protocol. And taking up our cross means that we use the same power options. He had the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. He had the use of Operation Z while he was growing up. We have the use of Operation Z. The same things. He had the use of the ten problem solving. Well, eight for him. He didn't have a sin nature. He did not need rebound, and he did not need to be filled or, or to be occupied with himself. And we need uh, those two extra because we are fallible with sin natures. And that gives us an, a little extra uh, momentum because we need it. So we have the, the flot line, the problem-solving devices. He had eight, we have ten. He had the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics. We have the same things. The, th the same things our Lord have had, we have. And the fact that we have them means that uh, there's nothing that we cannot bear and we have a staying power that can keep us in marriage, keep us in relationships, but there's a sword there always. Always there's a sword. And when the, and when the Lord, uh, well, when one person goes for doctrine, the other doesn't, there's a sword right there, right in between them. And it's hard to overcome. You can overcome it with impersonal love if you're on, that, on the side that is going for the word. And, but it's going to be difficult. And you're going to have to really uh, go it alone and strive. It will probably motivate you to get with it. And whoever does not take up his cross, that means to live the protocol spiritual life and follow me, is not worthy of me. So if you decide to do this, if you decide to go into the cosmic system because the pressure is too great, and the pressure will be great, 
When you're living the spiritual life, suddenly uh, people who have always been your friends will start to break away from you. And people whom you've always thought were wonderful people will start to stab you in the back. Now you have a choice. You're growing in grace and you have a choice. You can say, I love them more than the spiritual life. And you can say, you know what? I'm going with them. And you've just let them take away your crown. You've just let them take away your eternal rewards. You said, I would rather have love with these people than love with God. Now, it doesn't mean you still can't love these people. You can, but you have to do it from impersonal love. You have to do it from a standpoint of, I will love them on the basis of my integrity. They're going to attack me. Well, let them do it. You'll get blessed for it if you know how to handle it. And what will happen is you will say, I have integrity. I love these people no matter who and what they are. And then when they attack you and you don't do anything about it except leave it in the Supreme Court of Heaven instead of getting all riled up and trying to get in the fight with them and you leave, him, leave them in the Supreme Court of Heaven, guess what? You get blessed because they've been judging you. And remember that from Matthew chapter 7. When you are judged and you leave those people before God... They will be the ones that receive the judgment three times over and you'll be the one that receives the blessing. So there's a system to handle it. In here, it can't handle anything. It constantly attacks. It constantly says negative things about people living in the spiritual life. People living in the cosmic system constantly attack the spiritual life. And it's going to make you want to say, I give up. It's going to make you want to say, look, I love my friends more than Christ so I'll go this way. That's what happens. And that's what happens to a lot of people. And that's why in Scripture it says, don't let people take away your crown. They're gonna, you're going to receive hate. But really, if you learn the spiritual life, it's not going to be hard for you to deal with because you'll get to a point of spiritual self-esteem eventually and you'll say, I don't care what they think. I love them. You'll still love them impersonally. And when they come around, you'll treat them with hospitality and you'll offer them a drink of tea and maybe a biscuit or something else. And you'll still offer them uh, all the uh, normal things anyone else would. But guess what? You're not going to be the one attacking. They are. They always are. It's happened in my life. And I have uh, some people in my family whom I love very, very much. Uh, but they're uh, too far gone to even uh, catch on to these things. So when they come to me and try to tell me to uh, listen to Charles Stanley, he knows a lot, then I just have to uh, keep my mouth shut. Because, uh, well, Charles Stanley, he's not, he's not that bad. It's just watered down. Way, way watered down. I mean, it's not... It's, it, uh, but uh, still, I mean, it's still, it's still like an insult. They, I've never told them who to listen to. I never even went up to them and said, hey, listen to this guy. Never done it because I knew it would be of no value. But they'll always attack you. Well, you have to have impersonal love. And you have to be able to handle these people. And this is what Christ is saying. If you start to have a focus on people rather than on God, rather than on Jesus Christ, and you start to worry about what people think rather than what Christ thinks, you're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. And you'll go the same way they've went, and you too will become a source of attack for people who are living the spiritual life. But for the people who are living the spiritual life, it's a source of blessing. It's like uh, going into the military, and they shoot bullets over your head to test you. And you have to be able to stay down, stay down low, and stay under. You don't get offensive, do you? Not when you're, not when all of the people are lined up and they're do -do 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 with the machine guns, and they go woo woo right over your head, and there's a barbed wire there. And some people have been known to freak out and stand up and get shot and killed. Well, you got to stay low. And when they come around attacking you, well, just ignore it. That's the principle. Ignore it. You, you're living your spiritual life. You're definitely not going to change their mind. And the principle we get out of this is that we cannot change evil, but evil can definitely change us. And when the barrage of evil is flying over our heads and we try to change it, well, you're just standing up in front of a firing squad and they will mow you down. 
when you try to change evil. You can't. You see, people who are positive will find their way to a place to receive the message. And people who are negative will find their way to attack. But you see, some of us uh, might get discouraged and we might want to see a lot of people here. But uh, you know what? You know what I like? I like seeing people who love the Word of God. I like seeing people who will come in on a Monday night rather than doing something else, sit down and listen to the Word of God and take it in. Because if there were 5,000 people here, do you know the amount of attacks that would occur? It would be unreal. You can't even imagine it, probably. Some of you probably can. You've been around it long enough to know that when you get in a big crowd, well, it's just like you've just jumped into a, a beehive, a wasp's nest. And if you uh, go into a wasp nest and jump in, and of course I understand it, you're gung-ho for the word, and you jump into that wasp nest, they're going to sting you. And you're going to end up uh, having a lot of hurt feelings. But remember, they stung the Lord. So what you need to do is just, uh, well, be glad that it's this small. Don't get anxious and don't say, it's just not going to work out, nobody ever shows up. It'll work out as long as you're positive and as long as I keep doing my job and as long as the Lord wants it to work out. You see, he could shut the door and that would be uh, perfectly all right with uh, me. Or he could keep it open, but either way, you're getting the word and you're receiving it, so, well, that's a good thing. And I receive very little in the way of attack in, in return a lot less than I would receive otherwise if it was a big congregation. So I like having it little. I get to test the waters and see how it is. Maybe it'll grow later, maybe not. But uh, we'll keep going and see what happens. Then in uh, 1040, well, 1039. 1039 is a bit difficult to understand uh, because of the, uh, the language difference between Greek and English. But it says, whoever discovers, discovers his soul will be deprived of it. And that is a correct translation, actually. Whoever discovers his soul will be deprived of it. But it, it's correct, but the, the, the Greek language is so detailed that it doesn't really cover it. And whoever discovers his soul, this is a reference to phileo. That was in 1038. It's a reference to love. Whoever discovers personal love toward people. You've discovered your soul. You've discovered your personal love toward people. Whoever has discovered their personal love toward people will be deprived of it. And all of us have personal love toward people, but eventually we are deprived of it because they pass on and go away. Or we pass on. Or a lot of people, if you live, all, if you live uh, long enough, you'll end up being an, a lonely old person with no one around you deprived of all of that personal love. And when you're an old man about to die, what, what, what worth was all of those relationships when they're all gone and you're 90 years old and everyone around you is gone? What worth was that relationship you had? It's not going to bring you comfort anymore because you die by yourself. What you should have had, what, you'll be deprived of it. You discovered love, you discovered personal love, and then you're deprived of it over time. And whoever gives up his life, that doesn't mean you physically uh, go and kill yourself or physically uh, give up your life in some way like that. This means that you're living the protocol spiritual life. And when you give up your life by living the protocol spiritual life, guess what? You're a servant. You're a slave. You've become a slave to Jesus Christ. But so what? You're a slave to a perfect master. So when you li live the protocol spiritual life, you've given up your human abilities in terms of living your spiritual life. You've given up your human works. You've given up your human talent in terms of living your spiritual life. Now, I'm not talking about human talent in baseball or football or basketball. That's normal, and you should use it if you have it, or in music or wherever you have it. But I'm talking about in the spiritual life. So you live the spiritual life, and when you do so, you're giving up your own life. You really are, but it's, it's not really a sacrifice at all. It's not asceticism. 
And you're not giving up something grand. You're giving up something pathetic. And you're exchanging it for something beautiful and wonderful. It's like the young girl who, uh, well, her birthday was very close to Christmas. And on her birthday, which was very close to Christmas, her father gave her a set of plastic pearls. And she loved them. I guess she was about 11 or 12. And she loved these plastic pearls. And she wore them around her neck. And when she took a shower, she wouldn't take them off. She would go to bed, leave the plastic pearls on. Loved them. And then Christmas morning, she gets up and she's all excited about Christmas. And her father's sitting in his recliner in front of a fireplace. It was a wealthy family, a big fireplace. And he says, uh, come here, daughter, whatever her name was. He called her by her name, but I don't remember her name. And he said, give me them pearls. And she said, daddy, but I love these pearls. And he said, I don't care. Give me them pearls. You do what I say. Well, she didn't know what he was going to do, so she just said, all right. She took the pearls off and gave it to the man, to the father. And he took those pearls and he slung them into the fireplace. And they started to burn up. And she started to weep and wail as only a little girl can. And she ran up to her room and slammed the door. And she cried until she didn't have any more tears to cry anymore. You think that's cruel, don't you? But guess what happened? A little later, the father goes up to the uh, second story where she is uh, on the bed still trying to uh, cry and knocks on the door and says, Come out! Time for you to come out. And she says, No! She's still mad. And then he gets tough with her and says, Come out! So she gets a little scared and she walks out of her room and when she sees his face again, she goes, And the tears start running again. And so he takes her downstairs and he opens up a box, a Christmas present, and pulls out a brand new set of pearls. Real pearls, not plastic imitation pearls, real pearls. And he lays it around her neck, and she's still crying. She can barely see, so she doesn't really know what's going on. And then finally she realizes what has happened, and now she's extraordinarily happy again. Well, guess what? Your spiritual life are real pearls. That stuff you live outside of the spiritual life is imitation. And if you're worried about what people think about you, you're looking for imitation pearls. And if you're thinking about, uh, well, I need to do this to please my father and mother, that is, if you're older, I'm talking if you're uh, older and you're still as a, a, a 50-year-old person trying to please your father and mother, you're looking for imitation pearls. We can please the Lord Jesus Christ. That's real pearls. We can live the spiritual life. That's real pearls. Now, we can still cry and weep and hold on to the imitation pearls. We can still uh, say to ourselves, I'm under attack all the time. I'm going back into the cosmic system where people loved me. That's imitation and you'll still have your imitation pearls, and you'll still wear it around your neck, and you'll still love it, and you'll still love living in the world, and you'll love that. But for the people who live the spiritual life, they'll be loving the real pearls, and they will have a true life of happiness. So surely, if you go in the cosmic system, you have re your reward, fake pearls. But if you live your spiritual life, you will have your reward, real pearls that withstand fire and last forever and ever. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things. And, we may, and may we come to grow in grace and in knowledge and to realize that our emphasis in life should always be on the Word of God and not on people. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.